Thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. Great to see you from the stage. Thank you very much, Michael, for that awesome introduction. That, uh, that means a lot to me because I think Michael uh, should be on stage here too talking because he is a great optimizer. But he's doing a great hosting too. So please give a hand for the hosting and also for Alexa, of course. Um, I love to be at CXL. It's my fourth time. I did a presentation here three years ago. I uh, was just an attendee two years ago in San Antonio. Uh, did a workshop last year on A-B testing and now back on stage. I think this is a special event. Uh, the fact that we are all together for three days in a row in the same hotel, the same resort, oh, that's amazing, that's lovely, because it's, it's not just the speakers on stage. Uh, the, the quality of knowledge from you all, all the attendees, is so much bigger than just a couple of people on stage. So the time talking to each other is so valuable and so important. So please join me this evening for beers in the Texas sunsets. Lovely weather over here. Uh, but also make sure we keep on optimizing the KPI of not having hangovers the next morning. <laughs> so validation in every organization. Um, I'm the founder and owner of Online Dialog, which is a fast-growing conversion consultancy company in the Netherlands. And I've learned a lot working with these clients over the last couple of years. Uh, but before I'm going to share that knowledge, I first want to dive in a small story for myself. We're going back to the late 90s. And in the late 90s, I was a host at this local radio station. And my setup looked a bit like this. Uh, some old computers, some musical equipment over there, some mixers, an old keyboard. And I produced my own show for two hours on Friday evening. And it took me always 16 hours to prepare, but I was an optimizer already back then. So I was able to get that time down to four hours preparation. And what I did, I was looking on the web for the newest MP3 downloads. I wanted to play music that was not out there in the studio yet on CD. Well, CD, yeah, CD. <laughs> MP3 downloads. And I also used a mini disc player to pre-record items in my show. So I could uplift the quality of the spoken words in between the music. And I also created a website with Microsoft front page. <laughs> 1989. But with the website, I was available 24-7. People could send me in stuff because I also opened up a Hotmail email address. <laughs> so they could tell me which local events were going on, which I could present in my show, which I pre-recorded, uh, and, and gain more listeners because that was my end goal. I wanted to reach a broader audience. Because while you keep on growing and getting more audience to your show, you get more advertising. And if you get more advertising in, you can buy better equipment. And that's why I was... Uh, Radio person, I just love to make radio. So I tried to convince all the other hosts in the station that like this is the way forward. This is how we should produce radio shows, uh, pre-record stuff, newest music, uh, have a website, have email, and I tried and I tried, but well, they just believed in more radio. I could not convince them. And I left the station. <laughs> Heartbroken. And the fun thing is, nowadays, they still exist. It's 2019, they're still out there, they're still a local station, and they even have a website. <laughs> but I fell in love with creating websites already back then in 1998, so when I left the station, I started to create websites. And the thing I really liked about having websites is being able to do analytics-driven optimization. I just dove in my log files, it's scrap and cut and paste and try to find out what was going on, what hits were making sense, and based on the data, try to optimize my own little website. And over the years, it grew on to experimentation on customer experience. And that's what, we, what I've been doing with Online Dialog for the last couple of years. And this is a fun business. I've learned so much about digital user behavior. It's amazing. I really understand attention, uh, how perception works about needs of users, about their motivations. It's fascinating consumer psychology stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm humble and happy to be able to present this nowadays to an audience that does believe. And not like the old radio hosts that didn't believe my 
way going forward. You, you guys are fully into CRO, so it's great to be here among this group of CRO people who really think that CRO is an important part in the company. It's this green little dot where we're making a difference, a difference between all the other departments out there. And all the other, other departments in this company, uh, we believe, should be doing CRO too. It should be more like this. Or even like this, like one big CRO company where it's like CRO is in the heart of the company and everyone is doing CRO. That's the one we're striving for. But I think we're on the wrong track. I think we're doing something really, really, really wrong. So in this presentation for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you why I think our CRO jobs will die. Why it actually might be a good idea to kill the CRO jobs. And as a final point, how we could reach our end goal. And what is that goal anyway? So let's first dive in why our CRO jobs will die. The, the way CRO started in most companies, like from 2010, 2011, was this one person, MacGyver, <laughs> man or woman, uh, trying to use VWO, we just came to the marketplace, or Optimizely, doing some WYSIWYG experimentation uh, as, as the jack of all trades, uh, trying to optimize the MacGyver style. And those experiments were mostly based on low hanging fruit, just stuff that was leaking on the website, fixing errors by running experiments, not knowing a lot about statistics. So thinking that they were adding lots of value to the company. They thought they found real gold. Uh, probably they sometimes even did. But they were also really good in convincing upper management that they had gold, real gold in their hands. So they should go up from the MacGyver state to the A-team state. We should have a multidisciplinary optimization team running conversion optimization with a copywriter and a designer and a developer and an analyst, a whole team running more experiments, which they did. The conversion team runs experiments. And what they do is like these six, six weeks sprints, one experiment, like the, the, the hypothesis setting, the design, development, testing, outcome results. That takes like six weeks or seven or eight weeks. And another one, and another one, and of course it's more like this. They start new ones every week because they have a whole team, so lots of resources, so lots of experimentation going on. That's the conversion team. In the meantime, you have the product teams. And the product teams, they sprint. They do sprints, two-week sprints, to release stuff, get things done. Sprinting, sprinting, sprinting. And the marketing teams, they're doing like preparing a campaign, and preparing another campaign, another campaign, another campaign, which is on a different pace than the experimentation team or the conversion optimization team is doing, which is somehow a nightmare because the optimization team wants to freeze the web page. You cannot touch this. There's an experiment running. Don't make any changes. Your campaign cannot go live because we're running an experiment on this specific page. So the optimization team becomes a nightmare for the product teams and the marketing teams. And this is not how you want to embrace this CRO in the heart of the company. In the meantime, the optimization team is learning a lot. They're gaining lots of knowledge on consumer psychology. And they're, they're really proud to share it. They've learned a lot. Uh, and they want to enable other teams to do optimization too. Uh, they're on a different page, but they try to convince them. And with convincing them, something really important pops up, something I've learned over the last two years. And that's this difference. Optimization teams have lots of pride. Their DNA, their fixes, their optimizers, they're getting things done, they're fixing conversions. Their DNA is they focus on other failures. The self-righteous, overly critical, and fault-finding, which is a really good thing to have as an optimizer, <laughs> looks at their life through a telescope, but others with a microscope. So they're telling these other teams what they're doing wrong. On the other hand, you have humility. And being more humble, it's about uh, realizing how far they fall short. They have an overwhelming sense of the need to grow. They're compassionate and forgiving and look for the best in others. So these optimization teams really have strong pride. But humility is lacking. 
It's more like uh, thinking is not thinking less of yourself, is thinking of yourself less. And that, that's what optimization teams should do. Because in the, in the long run, uh, we are running at the wrong pace with the wrong mindset to grow. Uh, if you want to scale up from MacGyver to A team to an evidence based growth company, you need to enable people. And now we're just in the way. We're at the wrong pace and trying to convince people to do something they don't want to do. Well, that's why I think our current zero jobs will die. But it gets better. I think it actually might be a good idea to kill those zero jobs. And I mean really kill them. Because first of all, come on, the name. Conversion rate optimization. Who came up with that? Brian. Yeah, I know, Brian Eisenberg and Jeffrey. Uh, the, the Eisenberg brothers, who are here in Austin, so it's the fault of the Americans, <laughs> they had a problem with sales funnels, and they wanted to optimize people going through, which they called conversion rate. And they had an agency back then, and the, that agency was doing SEO, search engine optimization. So then they came up with the name conversion rate optimization. The good thing is, outside of the States, everyone calls this conversion optimization. But you guys still call it conversion rate optimization. I think that name should be burned. <laughs> it's a terrible name. And lots of people agree, like Pep. This is from the CXL Facebook group two years ago. Uh, lots of zero people are unhappy with the term zero since it doesn't describe what we do. Uh, we're not optimizing conversion rates, because if you want to optimize conversion rate, just kill your affiliate traffic and conversion rates will go up. Uh, we want to have more sales, more leads, more long-term growth. That's what we're doing. So we had this long discussion on the name. Uh, Brian Googleman, speaking in here too. Uh, he said, I hate it too. I think it's more about efficiency, getting the most output for the least input. All processes uh, can and should be optimized for the best possible return. So I like the O, optimization, but please drop the C and the R. Well, I do agree there. Optimization is important. But then you have this guy saying, OK, but I think it should be bigger. We are more important. Uh, we should go for hero, high quality experience and revenue optimization. <laughs> Talking about humility here. Uh, this one is important too. Aren't we trying to improve user experience in the end? Conversion optimization is client centric. It's, 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 uh, I'm not sure. But outcome optimization, Craig Sullivan. Uh, with the S, of course, he's from the UK. Um, the make it so school of thinking. I, I like the optimization part, and I think Pep agreed because he registered the domain optimizationxl.com, <laughs> which he still owns. Uh, hopefully, you also have oxl.com. I'm not sure about that. And it went further on because we truly believe that in the end, it's all about long term impact XL to go through. So no, no, don't think you did register that domain name. It's not the best name ever. Um, but the one where I most agreed with in that conversation was Gal Gillis from Belgium saying, ah, don't focus on the term or the next burst word. Uh, just help your clients grow their business. It's not about you. It's about them. Don't care if, uh, they don't care if you call it usability, UX, zero, growth hacking, or Yulupilukulushupabuba, which is a great domain name, by the way. Totally agree with Carl here. Don't focus on the term. It's a shitty term. We have to deal with it. Uh, the reason why I think we should kill the safe zero jobs is why are we optimizing low hanging fruit? Why are we fixing the leaky bucket? Uh, other people are making mistakes, and then the optimization team needs to fix it. It doesn't make sense. Uh, those mistakes should not be there from the beginning. Uh, and of course, the team should not focus on best practices, but there are lots of usability principles out there. And make sure the teams understand that, the marketing teams, the product teams, so if they deliver something, that part is already fixed. It should not be done by the optimization team. And I'm focusing on button copy testing, button colors, headlines, and so on. You do, yeah, you can create an impact with optimizing that. Mostly small impacts, sometimes you have a big one. But this is going to be replaced by AI. The tweaking of going from the local maximum to the global maximum, that's something that AI will take care of. So don't focus on that part. And the channel, why are we always focusing on the web? And of course, mobile came in and tablets. But email, AdWords, Facebook campaigns, even non-digital channels 
like local stores. It's all optimization. Don't just focus on that one channel where you started with using VWO or Optimizely. It's all optimization. And optimization needs a KPI. The problem is what I mostly see with running experiments is the KPIs clicks. Or better, shifting behavior. Transactions getting better. Revenue per user even more better. But the thing you want to optimize for is potential lifetime value. That's the thing we're striving for. We're striving to grow companies not on short term, but on long term. There has to be some sort of overall evaluation criterion that can be used by every product team, every marketing team. They should not be conflicting. They should solve the conflicts some teams have. And I think the most famous example is from Microsoft, where the Bing team has the relevance team and the advertising team. And the advertising team wants to get more money out of advertising, and the relevance team wants to have better results. And their KPIs and experimentation are conflicting. So they came up with a new overall evaluation criterion that they can both use. And this criterion is, of course, based on something that has to do with potential lifetime value, something that has to do with customer experience. Another reason is that we're focusing on experimentation. Why just experimentation? There's so much more to learn and to test and to prove that something could work. Because in the end, we should be implementing stuff. Now, we're making money if we're implementing something. If we're not implementing something, nothing's going to happen. But then, w w why just use experimentation? Of course, experimentation is a really powerful way uh, with, with, with a high chance of being true, like a low bias, that you can find the right outcome and take that door and not the other ones. But there's way more ways of doing research to try to find the right door. This is the hierarchy of evidence. The medical world has been running randomized controlled trials and all sorts of research already for 40 years, 50 years. In our zero industry, we're only doing this for eight years. This is stuff they use. They say, OK, on the one hand, higher up the pyramid, there's a higher quality of evidence. Lower is a lower quality. On the other side, a lower risk of bias and a higher risk of bias. So randomized controlled trials, which is A-B testing in our language, is really high up there. And the only one topping that is a systematic review and meta-analysis of lots of randomized controlled trials. That's a high quality of evidence. But cohort studies, there's lots of data already in your system which you can use to prove what you need to implement. Uh, case control studies, case, case studies, surveys, even expert opinions can make a difference. But lower quality of evidence, higher risk of bias. But this, this, this is stuff to, that, that you can use to understand what you need to implement, because that's the end goal. We need to implement stuff. So summarizing this up is that what I think we are doing is we have the wrong name. We're doing the wrong stuff. Not on every channel with the wrong KPI and the wrong methodology. So to me, it kind of makes sense why it actually might be a good idea to kill those GVO jobs. But then what should we do? What is our end goal? What are we dreaming of? What are we dreaming of to reach? In my opinion, optimization is all about effects. We're adding effect to a company. Become more effective, make better decisions. Getting more results out of the things you are doing. And this is a wonderful conference, because this whole conference is about effect, generating effect. But if you look in the conference world, the number of conferences out there that are on different topics, that are on the business side of things, on the IT side of things, talk way more about lean. They talk about Six Sigma. They talk about Agile. And they talk about Scrum. These movements are all popular methods to improve efficiency. This is, this is what they do, getting things done, lowering the cost of production. And this is what they have been doing for years and years and years. Uh, there used to be very slow waterfall methodology of getting things done. And with Lean and Agile and Scrum, they were able to really speed up, speed up the getting things done part. But they're still getting the same things done. 
So what I think we should do is combine efficiency and effects. The thing you want to strive for is getting the right things done, maximizing production success. So if you look at a company that wants to maximize production success, should it be the CRO team doing that or all the other departments? Because we like to see us as this big green dot inside the company, in the center of the company. Uh, in reality, it's more like this. We're just a small part in the company. Uh, and what makes more sense? That this small team of optimizers is helping the company to grow, to create more effect, or that all the other, other departments together are creating more effect? Yeah, it's the same as what I said about the speakers on stage. The speakers have knowledge, but I'm pretty confident that the 400 of you in the audience together combined have way more knowledge. This is how it works. It's a numbers game. Uh, so if you're striving for putting effect in the heart of the company, what is the solution? How can you do this? And this is what we call a validation center of excellence. A validation center of excellence. They enable evidence-based growth. Uh, they, they put effect in the heart of the company. They're enablers. Now, what they do with optimization is they guarantee quality. They make sure that all the research is trustworthy, that the research is democratized, that all the product teams and marketing teams don't have to worry about statistics, because that's really hard. The Validation Center of Excellence makes sure that the statistics are right. It's, it's like raising up kids. Don't tell them what to do, but enable them to start doing things. And you want to set some borders to have quality control? But don't tell them what to do. It's the same working with teams. So what you should do as a validation center of excellence, make sure that all these tactics, you know, from, from surveys to, to user testing to randomized control trials, uh, are really easy to use for all those teams. Marketing teams and product teams, uh, it should be really easy for them to use those kind of research. And you should only worry about the quality. Not what they're researching, just make sure the quality is trustworthy. And this is exactly what front-running companies like Microsoft, Chad Sanderson is here, uh, he's presenting later on. Uh, Lucas Vermeer from Booking.com is also here. Booking and Microsoft focus on having a center of excellence, mostly on experimentation because they have high numbers, uh, so it's all randomized controlled trials. Uh, but not every company has the numbers of Microsoft booking. Uh, if you're a smaller company or a new product, you should go to other research methods, take some more risk, but still use the outcomes to prioritize your work and what you're going to implement. Because that's, that's the road we're taking. Enabling trustworthy research throughout the organization to democratize validation. And if you're doing this, if you're shifting your CRO team from MacGyver to A team to an enabler, to a validation center of excellence, please remember this slide. If you have a really good optimization team now, they're on this side. If you need a validation center of excellence, you need people that are on this side. And because in the end, it's, it's the other departments that should do the work. They should embed validation and effect in what they do, in all their campaigns and all their sprints. It should be evidence-based. Uh, they have a prioritization of implementation. And this is especially where you're helping them. Because the only thing they do is implement stuff. But you want them to have the best implementations. Uh, pick the right ones. So we have a formula for this, which we call the validation equation. It's the quality of evidence percentage on the research they did times the potential effects on the overall evaluation criterion, divided by costs. And if a team is running on this formula, used to prioritize what they do, they can play around with it. They can, they can have more research, higher quality research, uh, to have an effect on what they do. They can play around with costs. The company can use this to, should we have more teams or fewer teams? And I know this stuff is kind of hard, especially at the end of the talk, and this is a whole different talk. You need like half an hour to go in depth. Um, so I'm just giving you the formula. But what I'm doing, if you hit me on LinkedIn, I publish a lot the couple of last months on, on this specific validation formula. Uh, my latest article on LinkedIn can always be found here. Um, in this case, it's about uh, the madness of business case calculations. 
which is a fun, fun, fun little article on false discovery rates and, and uh, type M errors. Uh, but this is all part of the validation formula. So if I write a new article, I will update the link, and you can always find the latest article. And please give feedback. Uh, we're still learning. After being in this business for 20 years, I'm still learning too. But what I've learned a lot the last couple of years is that uh, we used to say you should have a conversion champion in your company. Um, I think it should be a validation champion, but I don't really care about the name. It's all about the effect. But this person needs to be an enabler. So maybe the word champion is even wrong. It's an enabler. And that enabler in the company is going to make sure that everything is going to work. Uh, enabling trustworthy research throughout the organization to democratize validation. Uh, that, that's how you get effect, because that's what we're striving for. Our goal is effect, and we want to get effect in the heart of the company. So that's what we're doing, and using a validation center of excellence to get there. And that's how you get validation in your organization. Going back to my story in the beginning, and being that local radio host, what I've learned now 20 years later, that I, I was just pushing, telling all the other hosts, like, this is the future. Go on the web, uh, pre-produce everything, automate it, email. I've learned what I should have been doing is helping them to set up a website. Uh, let them write down what they want to say on the website and, and create it for them. Print out the emails they will receive so they can have the email on paper and read it. I was a pusher. I was not an enabler. And what could have happened if I found out already 20 years ago that enabling was way more important than being the, the pusher, the champion, the optimizer itself. Who knows what would have happened to that local radio station. So go forward and embrace validation in your organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. That was, I personally really, really, really like that talk a Thank lot. And I think you've given us all a lot to think about. Let's do a couple of questions. Is your, uh, in your ideal company, are there optimizers within each function, or is there an optimization function which serves the others? Yeah, I think the, the talk already explained it in the end. Um, that I think there are researchers needed in every marketing and product team, um, that the center of excellence make sure that research can be done in a high quality way. Um, so the, 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 there is a validation center, and there are researchers in every team. Uh, how have general themes changed since you were presented last time? How have general themes I, I, changed? I think general oh. themes in, in zero. Um, good question. I, I'm, I'm not really sure what my talk was about three years ago. It probably was focusing more on A-B testing yeah. and, and how to do stuff. Uh, but if you look at the demand for our agency, uh, three years ago, uh, uh, companies uh, uh, were outsourcing their conversion optimization to our company. I like fix the sales funnel, run experiments, whatever you want to do, just fix conversion rates. But that demand changed because I think everyone saw the importance of having CRO in a company. So we got invited more and more to create a culture of experimentation or to embed experimentation or validation inside companies. And in, at first, we came in with this aggressive way of, like, this is how you should do it. So over the years, we have learned that, that, that it's a different approach needed if you do that kind of work. So I, that, 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 I think that's changed. The, the biggest change to me is that that's more in-house, in-house, in-house is doing this. So let's round off with the last one. It's not so much a question. It's more like a statement. Since you want to kill our jobs, I think beer's on you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, it, it's a metaphor. I think the way we're doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, please join me for, for beers in the Texas sunsets and have talks on this because I think and, it's an important topic. Yeah, <laughs> and all these other questions, please go and talk to Ton about it. Thank you so much, Ton. <laughs> Always a pleasure, man.